in the 80s, the people that uh, were working uh, in electrophysiology, and we had the chance to work with Professor Wallens at the time, we were devoted to diagnosis. The only thing we were interested in were how, how to make the diagnosis of different arrhythmias, how to learn why the arrhythmias were happening. But uh, still we were curing nothing. We were doing very long studies that at the end were good for science, but were not helping patients at all because we don't have any tool to treat the patients. Of course, we were building up all this knowledge that in the future will be able to help people, but this we didn't know yet. It was in the 90s that the revolution started. And the revolution started when, after being studied all these arrhythmias and knowing what was happening with these arrhythmias, we realized that we could cure these patients, that we could use a catheter and go at the site that we have identified as being responsible for the arrhythmia and we could eliminate this site and cure the arrhythmia. There are very few things in medicine that cure. Maybe anti antibiotics cure infections. Some uh, surgery might cure some tumors, but the rest is not curing. It's just changing the behavior of a disease or changing how the progression of the disease will happen but when we're dealing with ablation, in many of the patients we're able to cure. And the ones that had the chance to live this moment in our life, in the first line, this is something you cannot forget because it was patients there that have been with tachycardias for 30 years, 40 years, every week. And then suddenly you bring them to the DP lab, you burn the tachycardia and they were cured and they could not even believe that, okay? So this is something that now we don't see in anymore because all these patients are already, all of them are cured and we are only seeing the new ones coming but not the ones that were there in, 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 in the history of electrophysiology. But the very important thing that we learn is that we're dealing with electrical signals and that the important issue was to look at the electrical signals. And we need to have something that allow us to clearly identify these electrical signals as something, as something important. And that's why at that moment, people like uh, Bert van der Stel, who is the founder of all this story, together with uh, Leo Domen later, he was an engineer at the Maastricht University, and he was developing a system to uh, try to uh, record all these electrical signals. This is, you're looking now at the very first system that was called at the time EMS that was installed in Barcelona in December 1991. And here I was with uh, Bert van der Stel and uh, we were uh, treating the first patients at that time. As you see, the computers were very old-fashioned, everything was all fine, we were much younger, okay, than today, and the color of the hair is different also. But you see that this was the basis of what later on has become Cardiotech. So this was the beginning of the story. And when we discussed with Bert about how, what, what do we want, because of course, technically, he, he knew how to do it but he need to know what was our needs as physicians. And I always tell to him three things. We need excellent electrical signals, the best electrical signals you can get. This is the first thing. If you don't have good signals, forget it. And you are Dutch, and Dutch know about electricity. So you should have good electrical signals. <laughs> the second thing I say, we need an integrated system. We don't want to have eight different devices. We want to have something that is compact, that is, can be used just very compact, and you have everything there. And you have the recording, you have the pacing, you have the ablation, you have everything there. So don't bring me a pacer and a recorder and a mapper, because this doesn't make any sense. And third, and this was my own obsession, I need something that is easy to use, 
because it should be a single operator. We say, why single? Single operator. If you want something to be success, single operator to be. If I need a technician outside and another technician inside and a nurse, and then we will never go on with the system. So these were the three principles that we have been discussing with him, and he has been working to get this. As we learn from Frank, in uh, the year 2000, the company was uh, 2000. Yeah, this company uh, uh, was uh, transformed into a company. So the the Maastricht University company became a real company. Okay, and then later on it was it was uh, put by uh, Schwarzer. So the signals is what do we work. So we need these electrical signals, and we need clean signals, we need reliable signals that we can look at it, that we can uh, do all the analysis that we require to make sure that what we do is right. And this is true for uh, tachycardias using accessory pathways, this is true for atrial flutter where we want to see the whole circuit with the whole signals and trying to identify where is the, 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 the link that is more suitable for ablation. We also need these signals in cases where what you have is what we call automaticity, like these arrhythmias where you need to see exact site of origin and we're dealing with milliseconds. So we need very reliable and clean signals to make sure that we are on the right millisecond of the signal to be sure that this is the origin of the arrhythmia, and we can do that because of the system, as I was saying, uh, 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 with this uh, very nice thing, but also something that maybe today some engineers will love about, which is the trigger mode. Trigger mode, which is looks so simple. No? You just have a trigger mode. You, you have bit to bit. This was the most incredible thing that was happening in electrophysiology, is that the system start to have a trigger mode. And we could see bit to bit. So and we were analyzing bit to bit, so I can move my catheter and bit to bit see what I was doing with my catheter and look at the right side and at the right spot because of the bit to bit trigger mode, which today everybody has. But at that moment, this was like something absolutely crazy that was developed by the AP Trace. And so it's good to remember history, you know, because sometimes things after some years happen and nobody remembers that, but for many, many years, the only reliable trigger mode was the one of the EP tracer, which makes a big difference in the EP world. And of course, this allows that you can do very simple procedures, very complex, but at the same time, you can do it very simple, like this one, which is a patient that has a, a, a arrhythmia coming from the aortic cusp which is a very dangerous site, and you can do that with a single catheter and probably in five minutes. And this is something that 10 years ago or 20 years ago would be absolutely mad even in just thinking to put a catheter there. Okay, and today we just go there, we map, we do the trigger mode, we analyze the site, we see the signal and we do it. So, um, and of course when you find the site to do the ablation, and the arrhythmia disappears, and that's it. I mean, it's as simple as that. Ablation is as, as complex, but at the same time, as simple as this. You can cure the patient in a few seconds, and that's it. So, of course, things have become more and more complex over time because we start uh, attacking more complex situations, like patients after a myocardial infarction that they have, you know, their heart is, is affected by the myocardial infarction. There are a lot of uh, dead tissue around, fibrosis, uh, uh, arrhythmia circuits that can happen, and, and of course is uh, or maybe a dangerous situation producing sudden death in some patients. So, but still, we can try to see if we can help the patient. And sometimes we have to go to the epicardium. This was done uh, first cases in 2002, 2003. In fact, the first cases ever done in. Uh, post myocardial infarction were done in Barcelona in our group. Uh, it has been described by a Brazilian group one year ago, one year before, in patients with Chagas disease, which is a disease which is uh, 
uh, very, very prevalent in South America and not in the rest of the world. But the, the ones that the first time that was done in the epicardium in post myocardial infarction, and this is one of the very first patients in the world, it was, uh, and, and you see again how important the signal is. You know, having this signal, which is a fractionated, very clean signal, it's extremely important for us because this is where you can, with the trigger mode, one by one, look at the precise signal, look at the exact side, the millimeter, the exact millimeter side that you want to apply. And when you have the signal, you can do it. If you don't have a good signal, you cannot do it. So the importance of the electrical signal. And of course, when you have this side, you can do the ablation and terminate tachycardia and cure the patient. But there are also other situations where the signal is extremely important. This is what we call a fascicular tachycardia. This is a tachycardia that comes from the same conduction system of the heart. So this means that things go very fast there. We are dealing with milliseconds, very fast conduction. And we have these kind of signals which represent the fascicular signal and is at the origin of the tachycardia. And here again, we require extremely good signals to be sure that we are on the exact millisecond signal that is the one responsible for the ablation. And only if you have systems that have very clean and reliable signals, uh, forgive me, but I will repeat that 100 times because it's the main issue of electrophysiology is the signal, the electrical signal, and having an extremely good signal is the basis of everything. And this happens with the cardiotech, not with many other systems. I'm sorry if there are other providers here, but it's true that the electrical signal, the best electrical signal in the world is the EP tracer signal, for sure, without any discussion. <laughs> so, and when you have, again, this uh, type of signals in the fascicle, you can do the ablation and cure the patient in a few seconds. In the year 2000, things get even more complex because atrial fibrillation, which was completely forgiven for us, we didn't want to talk about atrial fibrillation, we have too many tachycardias to cure, and atrial fibrillation was something happening in all people, and we were not very interested in that. But then, of course, we start curing the majority of tachycardia, and we had time available, let's say, and then we decided that probably atrial was also a very good thing to do, especially because of these works, pioneering works by the people in Bordeaux, where they say that the many of the atrial were starting in the pulmonary veins. So if we knew where the tachycardia start, we could go there and block this start and eliminate the starting point of the arrhythmia, and maybe with that we would cure the arrhythmia. And then started what is called the pulmonary vein isolation. And of course here, again, the signals are extremely important because what we are dealing here is signals inside the pulmonary vein. And we have to record the signals, know exactly where the signals come from, and block the signals to have an electrical isolation of these pulmonary veins. And here we need, again, simple things. We need simple tools, and you can do that by using a very complex 3D mapping systems, or you can do that with a cryo balloon. And of course, I'm a I'm big fan of cryoablation. I was co-author with Professor Kainz Cook of uh, uh, probably the first uh, randomized trial published in New England, which was the fire and ice trial. By the way, I spent the night in the fire and ice hotel, which uh, was a big surprise for me when I saw the name of the hotel, because that was the name of our trial published in New England Journal of Medicine some years ago. And uh, so the importance of having simple tools to do that and to treat patients. There are thousands of patients, millions of patients with atrial fibrillation around. And, and we, are not, we are completely unable to treat them all. We don't have facilities, we don't have, we don't have uh, physicians, we don't have uh, tools to do that. So, Whatever we do to simplify things, will be absolutely welcome to treat more and more patients. So you see that one of my obsessions always have been to simplify things, simplify things, simplify things. When I was talking 20 years ago with the people in electrophysiology, I say, you, you, if you keep making things very complex, even the language very complex, you will never be relevant. Because if you are able to do one patient per day, 
which is extremely complex and you will publish every single patient, you will be scientifically very important but socially irrelevant because doing one patient per day means nothing. We have to be able, like hemodynamics do or like a, a invasive cardiology, to do 20 patients per day. And if we are not able to do that, we'll be irrelevant. And that's, to do that, we need to simplify, simplify things. And this is one of the things that I think should be simplified, which is the ablation of the pulmonary veins. Because if you put together, if you put together in this integrated system that I always was talking with Bert, you put together the cryo and the EP tracer, you might have the solution. Because you might have a very simple tool, which is a cryo console that has the signals you require and have the pacing that you require. You don't need the full EP system. You don't need the full EP lab to do that. You just can do it very simply by integrating uh, simple, simple things, simple tools that can be used easy. Of course, this increasing complexity that we have lived uh, has bring to a need of more accuracy on what we are doing, because we are doing AFib, we are doing ventricular tachycardia, we are doing very complex situations with abnormal hearts that require a more specialized and more accurate uh, tools like, uh, like a CT scan to visualize different things or like the nuclear magnetic resonance imaging that allow us to see the tissue and see exactly where the problem is. And of course, integrating these, all this uh, all this uh, uh, information, you can come up with very nice pictures, with very nice images, like this is a Galgo is a company, a Barcelona-based company that we are working with, integrating the image uh, and the nuclear magnetic resonance image with the electrophysiological image to try to identify the bundles that are responsible for arrhythmias, especially in the post-myocardial patient. But again, Again, everything is based in electrical signals. If you don't have a good electrical signal, you will be unable to find what you are looking for because what we are dealing is with electricity. The electricity of the heart and the electricity is signals. So we require the signals. And again, our, the system, the cardiac system, even in very complex situation, it can produce wonderful signals that will help you identify the pathways that are producing all these arrhythmias and you can precisely identify the exact point that you need to ablate to normalize it. So again, this integrated system, this uh, simplified tool, these excellent electrical signals become more and more important. There are more evolutions in the things and the evolution is pacing. We have been dealing with uh, cardiac pacing, pacemakers for many, many years. But this is, again, a revolution ongoing. And the revolution is physiological pacing. If I pace a patient, I should have the heart beating exactly the same as if they would not be a pacemaker there. So it means the, for the non-physicians that our, our, the time it takes to activate the heart is what we call the QRS time period. If I have a, a narrow QRS, everything is going well. And this is the situation we all should have. If I pace the heart in the wrong direction, I will have a wide QRS. And this is not good for our heart. So the physiological pacing is bring back the QRS to a narrow one and have the exact pacing. So and this is done by the physiological pacing. And again, what do we need? Electrical signal. And we need a very simple electrical signal, which is where the conduction system of the heart is, where the cables of the heart are located. If I can identify the exact site where these cables are located, I can put my pacemaker there, and I can pace from there. And so I will have a normalization of the QRS. So that's why it's so important to have systems that allow you to integrate this information, which is the, the QRS complex, or so the electrocardiogram, and the endocavitary signal, so the his bundle signal, or the left bundle branch signal. And of course, again, this is on this uh, integration process, if you can have devoted devices, which are just done 
to do pacing, physiological pacing. You don't need the full EP system. You just need a very dedicated system that can be used in the second room, not in the big EP lab with millions of euros there invested, but in a small lab with only one X-ray and one very simple system that allows you to do the pacing. We are doing that. We, we are not doing the uh, device implantation in the big lab because we need that for other things that take more time. But if, if you don't have this type of device that allows you to integrate the information in the second lab, let's say, you will never be able to do physiological pacing. And physiological pacing, believe me, will be 100% of, of the pacing in the next five years. We'll stop with normal pacing and we'll go 100% to physiological pacing, for sure. This is absolutely sure. So let me go to my last part. It has been talking about humanitarian work, and of course the, the systems also, the system, the people, but also the systems and the technology should help us to help people. And as it has been said, there are many people around the world that cannot uh, have access to therapy, and cannot have access to technology, okay? And uh, I always say that the, the technology that is good for the child in Barcelona, in Maastricht, or in New York should be also available uh, for children in Maputo or whatever. So for that, you need something that can be packed, because if you cannot pack, you cannot travel, okay? So that's how we pack our systems, our EP lab, Okay, and uh, we bring it and uh, we transport it to the third wall and we install systems there. And then in these systems, depends sometimes in very poor conditions, others in not so poor conditions, we try to help as many people as we can. We have, uh, thanks to Cardiotech, because the first portable system went to Africa to help people there uh, so far. Uh, almost 1,000 children have been treated in Africa. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, thanks. Uh, of course, we, we take advantage of all these trips also to, to teach people. We like to teach the people. This here, you see, all students in medicine in the six years of medicine in Mozambique. Mozambique is a 40 million inhabitants country. And all the students are in this room for medicine for the six years. So you can imagine that they have a big problem. And of course, bringing, bringing I, I, if I would be the minister of health in Mozambique, I will not pay a single penny for me to go there to do this uh, high technology. That's why we go there, of course, for free in humanitarian, because of course they have other much more uh, uh, needs, more more urgent. But again, what I know is to do ablation. And if you can help people, then you should do it. So this is Aswan, nice picture. I love this picture with the the nurses, uh, training nurses uh, in Aswan. Also, you can help a lot of people there. And I'm just coming to the end because I'm extending too much. I want to show you something special because Cardiotech can also be used in special things. And this is very special. So this is a patient that has a wall of Parkinson White and a very strange electrocardiogram. In fact, I used to use this electrocardiogram with my, with my uh, 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 people in the university and in the fellows just to to challenge them, okay, because the electrocardiogram is extremely strange. But it has a wall Parkinson white, and this patient has tachycardia. So we did an ablation on him, and of course we used our marvelous portable system, and we had this incredible signal again, you see, where you can see the accessory pathway potential, you can see wonderful things there. Okay, and we, of course, we did the ablation, and the patient was cured, so there is no any more pre-excitation, but still a very strange ECG. And it, this is simply because this is the patient, okay? <laughs> so, so 
you can also have <laughs> sometimes they also have tachycardia so sometimes we can we can do this job and, and try to help them and, and thanks to the portable system we can also use it to treat sometimes this patients like that which was a marvelous patient okay this is uh, my second last slide I am Catalan and you know Catalans we like to build up castles in the air you know and and sometimes we fail you know eh, in our castles in the air but sometimes we we succeed and this is a marvelous 10 floor castle this is almost impossible to build up you need to trained during years and years and years to be able to build up such a castle. And we always use this to show that uh, to put the, the one on top usually is a, is a young girl, is a seven, eight-year-old girl, because girls uh, are stronger than boys at this age, and they, they are not afraid of going up. Uh, the boys, many, many times, the boy, when they are in the middle, if this moves a little bit, they go down, and you cannot finish the castle. But the girls are much stronger at this age. Uh, l later also. But <laughs> we, we, will not, we will not get into this, this, uh, <laughs> this thing. Uh, so, but we always say that for the girl to go up, we call that enchaneta. She's called enchaneta. Uh, the, any, any one on the castle is important also the people on, on the floor. If uh, there is no uh, teamwork, this cannot happen, okay? And, um, and I think that the, the electrophysiology, the ablation, all that we have been talking about, cardiotech, the history of, uh, of uh, these electrical signals, marvelous electrical signals that help uh, millions of patients around the world is, is a teamwork. And, and, and this work is thanks to, of course, many of you here, and, 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 and we should continue with the same work. And this is my last slide, which is something I love to say, which is that simplicity is the ultimate form of sophistication. So if you are able to do things very simple, is that you have attained the maximum level of sophistication. Thank you.